Are you guys excited? Are you guys excited to program? Yay, programming! Okay, I'm trying to get a laugh, guys. Um, thank you all for coming, even though I'm the one who actually came here. Um, but thank you for showing up today. I think this is gonna be really, really fun. I have a few slides, uh, about 10, and then we're gonna go and live code things. Uh, and I'll possibly even take some requests from the audience at the end. So as we're going through, start thinking of ways to make me trip on stage, uh, metaphorically, of course. I don't really wanna trip on stage. Uh, but try, try to come up with some of those, and we can try and program them later. Um, quickly, how many of you guys have been programming? How many of you started, like, beginning of the summer? Raise your hand. Only a few? Have you guys, how, how long, oh, I'm trying to think of the best way of doing this. How long have you been programming more than three months? More than six months? More than a year? Well, you guys already know how to do this. Why am I here? Um, well, we're going to go ahead and start with a quick thing on app development with Firebase. Have you guys heard of Firebase before? Anyone? Awesome. Then why am I here? You guys already know this. Um, how, I know you guys use Parse. Have you guys used Parse before? I think you're using it here. Fewer people have you? OK. Well, we're going to go ahead and convert you guys all to Firebase devotees uh, in the next hour. So quickly, uh, ooh, wrong one. Uh, a, a brief agenda of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to do a brief history of the internet and how applications are built on the internet. Uh, we're going to talk about what Firebase is. Uh, we're going to have a bit of content. That's those question marks. And then profit. We're going to go ahead and build an app in Firebase that is real time, that is quick, and I'm going to totally wing it just to prove to you how easy Firebase is to use. So um, I like to start off my presentations with this little uh, slide of a bunch of different devices. So I used to play a game uh, until someone broke the game where I would ask people how many devices they have on them at a time. So raise your hand if you have one device on you right now. At least one. Okay, keep it raised if you have two. Keep it raised if you have three. Keep it raised if you have four. This counts smartwatches. Okay, so I've done this before where someone had 10. They had like two laptops, two tablets, a smartphone, a smartwatch, a Pebble, like Google Glass. It was crazy. But the point is, as application developers, you guys have to build apps for all of these devices. Because there are people out there who wear their Google Glass, their two smartwatches, bring their laptop, bring their phone, bring their tablet. And they expect a seamless experience across all of these. That's the world we live in, right? I took a lift here, and I went ahead and ordered the lift and watched as it drove down the street and picked me up. That's the experience that we expect. And as I'm sure you guys know, after programming for six months or a year now, that's non-trivial, right? How many of you guys have struggled with a really, really difficult bug? Like spent days doing it? Because I spent 10 hours trying to get CocoaPods to just do my will yesterday. You guys know it's very, very difficult to do that. And so we're trying to go ahead and simplify that experience. So we live in this world that is backed by very complex infrastructure. I work for Google. This is a Google data center, one of about a dozen or so. Uh, they all look like this, just this crazy mess of wires and servers and cables and, and cooling. It's very, very difficult to go ahead and build the infrastructure that you need, especially for you guys. So how many of you guys have ever written server code before or know what a server is? Anyone? Was it a really fun experience? Did you enjoy it more than the client side code that you guys are doing now? I'm not, I'm not hearing any no's. I'm seeing a couple, sh yeah, yeah, OK. Um, it's really difficult. So typically, um, and by the way, I picked this word cloud just to show you how difficult and convoluted it was. So I gave a, a talk at the other make school up in, in San Francisco and was throwing out these crazy acronyms. And people are like, we have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and I realized when I Google cloud computing uh, and get these word clouds, I don't even know half the words there. Uh, and I'm a professional engineer. so. Don't feel scared, is what I'm trying to say. If you guys have any questions during this talk, feel free to ask me. Uh, feel free to do some covert Google searches. Um, but I'm going to try and go ahead and make everything uh, as simple as the data and cloud, not whatever other words are on there. So a quick piece on how to go ahead and build an application. Um, so most of the apps that you guys have probably built are kind of client side only. Is that correct? So you guys have built. Uh, you know, to-do list apps or things like that where you can go ahead and store your data locally, but if you go ahead and say now switch to your tablet and you run that same application, your data isn't synchronized across those. And so you guys went ahead and just built, 
Laser pointer? Oh, yeah. Laser pointer works. Something right on that device. So, and you guys, have you guys played with SQLite or Core Data at all? Anyone? A little bit? A little bit? Huge pain, am I right? Because you have to write basically an entire database on your tiny phone. Um, so, how do you go ahead and solve the problem of getting your data synchronized across multiple devices? And so typically, it's what, what this diagram shows. It's been called a three-tier architecture. Uh, have you guys heard of, we're getting into acronym land, a LAMP stack or a mean stack or anything stack? One of you? Okay, that's what they're referring to here. So you go ahead and have your device, which is your client code, and then you have these two other boxes, which are your server. So you have a server that's hooked up to a database or multiple databases. And what this does um, is this essentially goes ahead and process, processes requests. So your application will go ahead and request data from that application server. It will go to the database and, and query that. Uh, and so that could be something like your phone could go ahead and ask for a list of all users, and then your application server would go to that database and say, give me you know, this slice of users, and then it would be propagated back to your device or potentially your other devices. So for those of you who wrote uh, database code on your phone and know how much of a pain it is, now you have at least two more things to write code for. And how long do you guys think it would take to write a normal application, you know, very, even, even a very simple application, if you had to go ahead and write your client-side code? So at least in one, so at least in Swift or Objective-C, and then maybe in, in Java for Android, maybe who knows in C-sharp for Windows, there are lots of different things. And then you have to write your server code, and then you have to write your database code. How many of you guys think that you could do that all in a summer? You know, learn all three of those things and jam it all together and build, you know, the next Uber. Very, very difficult, right? So here's the quick punchline of why Firebase. Firebase goes ahead and takes all of that complexity out of having to manage and write your own servers. So how many of you guys have heard of the as-a-service kind of uh, moniker or name? Everyone kind of, you know, uh, hilariously appends it to, oh God, uh, you know, like lighting is a service. Someone will go ahead and bring lights into your place and set them up. Or, you know, I could be speaker as a service where someone says, hey Mike, we want you to come talk, and I go ahead and show up. So the whole goal is to go ahead and reduce something very complex just to a service that you hook up to. So, going back, we're going ahead, and as a back end as a service, so this is your back end, and this is your front end, so your client is your, your front end, your servers are your back end, we're going ahead and making that a service. So all you guys have to do is focus on writing client-side code, and we deal with all of the database stuff. So how many of you guys think now that it's very easy to go ahead and write your own entire application that syncs data across a lot of devices in a summer? Because you guys already know how to do 95% of the work. All you have to do is just write client-side code. So that promotes kind of two nice things. One, really, really fast development. How many of you guys enjoy spending weeks on those bugs? No one, exactly. Um, so now, we spend weeks and months and years on those bugs so that you don't have to. Fun value prop. The other big thing is, how many of you guys think that you could build an application that will serve, you know, 10 users? You guys think you could do that? 10 users? Okay, what about 100 users? Okay, what about 1,000 users? What about a million users? As you guys can see, those hands, they, they keep dropping. That's very, very difficult, especially when you start having things like nonlinear scaling. So, you know, you guys think, okay, I can have a server that holds 10 users, uh, and so two users, or 20, uh, two servers should hold 20 users. Doesn't quite work like that. So, if you go ahead and offload that scaling, then you don't have to deal with that problem. So that's kind of a quick value prop. The other big thing, so those of you guys have used parse, I kind of alluded to this idea of request response. So for most applications now, and for the internet generally now, when you go to a website, you make a request to that website, and then the server will go ahead and give you a response. So if you go to CNN.com or, or the BBC or wherever you go, Reddit, Twitch, um, you go ahead and say, hey, Reddit, give me this page. And Reddit will go ahead and respond with the HTML, CSS, JavaScript for that page. That's not very real time, right? Because you have to go ahead and query it, and then it takes some time. And if anything changes, the only way that you can find out about those changes is Command R or Control R. Uh, for those of you, I guess everyone here is with a Mac, so good choice. Um, but 
how do you go ahead and do that when you need real-time interaction with the world? So like with Uber, many of those apps do what's called polling. So it's the same as uh, if any one of you, if I said, hey, what time is it? Someone say the time. Okay, what time is it now? What time is it now? What time is it now? That's incredibly repetitive, right? So what if I just go ahead and say, what's your name? Ria. Sorry? Ria. Ria? Uh, can you notify me when it's the next minute? And every minute notify me when that minute happens. So now I get to go ahead and go over here and, and start doing other things. So like, uh, you know, what's your name? Chloe. Chloe, what's the temperature right now? Okay, make it up. Okay, so notify me when that changes, please. And so, as you guys can see, this idea of asynchronous tasks. So if I don't have to go ahead and pull someone and say, hey, give me the temperature, give me the time, you know, let me know what day it is, and I can just go ahead and, and register this asynchronous task of, hey, let me know when something changes in a certain way, I can go ahead and free myself up. And as application developers, you guys get to do the exact same thing. You get to go ahead and write code so that when one of your devices sends data up, it notifies all of the other that that data has, has changed in a certain way. So it's much easier. As you guys notice, the devices aren't all kind of pinging Firebase at once. They're going ahead and just saying, hey, let me know when something changes and send that data down to me. That's kind of this fundamental, I'm going to go for the paradigm shift here. You guys can all laugh that I'm saying like thought leadership and paradigm and, and things like that. But that is a very fundamental change because, again, it's, it's abstracting away so that you don't have to deal with the low levels of asking people or asking, in this case, servers for different things. And it's really, really, really simple. Um, so how many of you guys have heard of APIs before? So APIs are kind of the standard way of interacting with computer systems, right? So we have a very, very clean API. There are kind of three general things that you do with Firebase. And so the first one is this idea of creating a reference. So this is all Swift code, so it should look pretty familiar. Um, and what you're doing is you're creating a reference. So you could imagine I needed a reference uh, to go ahead and find out what time it was. I needed a reference to find out what the temperature was. So it's the same idea in Firebase. I need a reference to store my data and know where to put that data and where to synchronize that data. So that's what we have here. We have this idea of a Firebase object, which is a reference to a location in that little beautiful set of swirling cans on fire. Um, how many of you guys think that looks like an oil drum or like a stack of pancakes? Yeah, come up with whatever you want. If you guys have good ones, let me know after the show. Um, but you can go ahead and kind of visualize a Firebase as one of those. Um, in reality, what it is, is it's that giant set of servers that you saw on that second slide, only we're dealing with that so that you don't have to. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and set data in Firebase. So at that reference, I'm just going to go ahead and say, set the value to hello make school. So how many of you guys have heard of JSON, JavaScript object notation? So kind of the standard way of interacting with APIs, right? You go ahead and send JSON. Your server parses that and rips it apart and says, OK, I got a string, and I got a number, and I'm going to put them here. And then typically you get responses in JSON as well. And then you can go ahead and say, hey, I know what this format is like. So Firebase is very, very easy in that we just go ahead and use JSON for our data storage. Um, so you can go ahead and do something like set the value on that reference to a string. And that's all you have to do. How many of you guys have done anything with SQL before? SQL, ooh, yeah. How many of you guys have done anything with NoSQL before or heard of NoSQL? No? Okay, like one or two. So the idea, uh, quick tangent here, um, the idea behind a SQL database is, is it's, it's what's known as a relational database. So you have kind of a number of tables. So kind of like how you guys are a number of tables. So if I were to go ahead and ask you guys to come up with like a cool table team name, we could have like the unicorns over here and the rainbows here. Um, you can have a number of rows. So the rows could be the people in your table. And each of you have individual attributes because you're all people. So you know, you could have heads. Uh, and you could have feet. And so now I could go ahead and say, hey, unicorns, how many people are you? And you, know, you could go ahead and make these, these kind of queries on them. NoSQL kind of works a little bit differently. It's not SQL. Um, it's not this idea of tables. And so Firebase is a NoSQL database, uh, which basically just means that it's easier. Uh, well, that's a gross oversimplification, but we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, so all I have to do is 
I don't have to say, hey, some particular table or some particular something else. I can just set that value. The other thing, and I kind of alluded to it when I started doing my asynchronous thing, was this idea of observing changes. So with a normal database, you're going to go ahead and query it, do that request, and get a response. With Firebase, you go ahead and are going to be using, in Swift, you essentially have a closure. Uh, and that closure is going to go ahead and, you know, it's a, it's a callback. It's going to fire any time your data changes in a particular way. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying any time the value, so we have this event type of a value, any time the value associated with that reference changes, we're going to get this snapshot object. So in the, the example that I was giving up earlier, I would go ahead and say temperature ref, let me know whenever the value of the temperature changes. And we would get this snapshot that has the value of the temperature. Same with time. I could go ahead and have a separate reference that said it was my time reference, and I could do the exact same thing. And I will go ahead and show this in a minute. The other big thing, how many of you guys are in places that may not always have cell phone reception? OK. A lot of you. So I commute from Oakland to San Francisco every day. I work up in San Francisco, so I go through the Transbay tube, which is about four minutes and 36 seconds where I don't have internet. I know because I time it. Um, what do you guys enjoy doing? So like, do you just stand there and twiddle your thumbs for the four minutes and 30 seconds where the train is under the tube? No, you guys expect, and we all expect, that your applications work when it's offline. So how do you go ahead and have applications that work offline? You need to go ahead and mimic all of the business logic in those two servers and jam it all down to the phone or the tablet or whatever device it is so that you can go ahead and keep doing what you're doing and then synchronize that with your servers and, and everyone else. So now, if you were writing a traditional application, you'd have to write application server code, database server code, client code, so that's three, and then client application code and client server code or database code. So that's five. So you guys still think you could do that in a month or three months for the summer? It's very, very difficult. So what we've done is, again, we've offloaded that burden. So now, with Firebase, you can go ahead and whenever data changes locally, we actually write it to the disk on the device. So now we're going ahead and taking all of your application code and putting it in the client and then saying, hey, if you're connected, we'll go ahead and connect your data to our giant JSON blob in the sky, AKA that, the pancake thing. Um, and then when you're offline, we go ahead and store that so that you know, your end users don't really know what's going on. They just go ahead and see that when they come back online, we synchronize that data really, really smoothly. And that is, in API language, one line of code. Yay! Everyone should be really excited about that because I just saved you. Well, I didn't, but I kind of did. Uh, a lot of people in my company uh, as well as myself, just saved you guys a ton of effort. You don't have to spend you know, six additional months writing a bunch of code on your devices. You can just go ahead and in one line of code enable that functionality. And again, I will show this to prove that it is not magic. A quick other uh, couple features that we have. Um, how many of you guys have ever tried to, tried to write authentication code? So like logging in with Facebook or logging in with Twitter. Did you enjoy that experience? Because those APIs are really fun, aren't they, right? Even the Google Plus API, I spent several days of my life fighting with that thing. It's very, very difficult, right? Because the stakes are so high. So if I log one of you in as the other of you, that's a huge problem, right? So you have to write that code, and it has to be very, very good. And again, that's taking away from, um, you know, do your users care that you did a really, really good job logging them in via Facebook, right? They don't. Because they expect that's normal, and they expect every app has that. Um, so, yeah, your users also don't care what database they have, right? They only care that it works. Uh, and then the last one, uh, how many of you guys have ever tried hosting a website on your own? How many of you guys have personal websites? A few of you? Was that a fun experience either? Because you probably spun up at least one server and then you had to deal with hosting and then buy a domain and buy SSL certs and buy all these other crazy things that in that word cloud up there were the scary words? Yeah. So we go ahead and again, we're taking that and we're simplifying it. Uh, so I won't show that now because we're going to do a huge push on mobile. But if anyone is curious, how can I host my website for really, really inexpensively on Firebase, let me know and I'm happy to talk to you after this. So 
This is the, the judgment time where I go back to the back of the room and I'm going to open a fresh Xcode project and live code this entire thing from scratch. Are you guys ready? Fire up your Xcode. We're going to go ahead and have a fun next probably half an hour. Um, if you guys have any questions during this, feel free to stop me. I'm going to go ahead and kind of take out all of the magic tricks that I usually do and show you guys how we're going to go ahead and write a Swift chat app using Firebase. Is everyone ready? You guys, thank you, thank you, whoever wooed. So we're going to go ahead and again to prove to you that I know what I'm doing. Oops, not a playground. We're going to go ahead. Yeah, see, I got, I try and screw up early so that you guys laugh and and think I'm a bit of a klutz, and then when I actually screw up, you know, you don't notice. So we're going to go ahead and create a new project. So if everyone wants to go ahead and do that, we'll just go ahead and make it a single view application. Call it whatever you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and just call it Swift Chat. Uh, we don't need to go ahead and include anything else. We'll just make it for iPhone and in Swift. Go ahead and create that. I have far too many projects in my Firebase folder, but I will go ahead and create another one. And here we go. So you guys should just see App Delegate, View Controller, etc. So now, how many of you guys have used CocoaPods before? Most of you guys? OK, so go to the folder where you have, let me make this a little bigger, uh, the folder that you just created for that project. So mine is Swift Chat. So wherever you save that to, you should have uh, your Swift Chat folder and your, your Xcode project. And then you guys are going to pod init in there. So that should look pretty familiar. You have a pod file now. So what we're doing here is we're going to go ahead and add a dependency to our pod file. And that dependency is going to be on something called Firebase UI. So we have the Firebo Firebase CocoaPod, which just includes the normal Firebase library. And then we have the Firebase UI library, which will go ahead and pull in a couple convenience methods that I spent 10 hours fighting with CocoaPods yesterday to make for you. Uh, and that's going to go ahead and we're going to, have you guys heard of the term code golf? Anyone? So the whole goal of golf is to get the lowest score possible, right? So code golf is the idea of having the fewest number of lines of code possible. So we're going to go ahead and try and, and write a chat app in less than 50 lines of code. You guys think that's possible? 50 lines of code is like, that's the boilerplate in certain languages. Like, you're just stuck with that. We're going to try and do it in as few as we can. So we're going to open this pod file. So we've got that. And we'll go ahead. And it should look something like that. It has the platform and the platform version. We're going to use iOS 8 because. Oh, yeah, you guys can, if you just do, if you just type open pod file, that's going to go ahead and open it uh, in your default editor. You can also do Xcode open or open dash Xcode, I think, uh, and that'll open it in Xcode. You can also right click on it in the, in the GUI and do it that way. Let me quickly do that. So we're going to go ahead and do the use frameworks. Have you guys seen that before? You guys are using Swift, so you should have. Use frameworks, hopefully I spelled that right. And then we're also going to now say pod Firebase UI. And we're going to optimistically say 0 0.1. So I released 0.1.2 yesterday, so you guys should all get that. And that's all we had to do to go ahead and install Firebase. The use frameworks and pull in Firebase UI. So we can pod install that. And you guys should see something exactly like what's going to come up on my screen in two seconds, assuming I have internet. Yes? Yes, I can go back one slide. OK. So having that pod file open should look something like that, making it huge. So what you guys should have done is uncommented the platform and switched it to 8.0 8 and above, because uh, Swift is kind of interesting support below that. The use frameworks keyword, which will go ahead and kind of suck in the right things. And then this, which is kind of the, the meat of it. So you add a, a number of pods to go ahead and include various pieces of functionality. 
we're adding one called Firebase UI. And then using the little squiggly arrow to go ahead and say, we want anything that's in 0 0.1, and we want the highest one of that. Um, you guys could also explicitly say equals 0 0.1.2, but this is kind of the less breaky way of doing it. Is everyone good? Raise your hand. Uh, yeah, raise your hand if you're done. Yeah, there's no good way of doing this. Anyone need more time? I'll put it that way. A couple people? Can those around you guys help each other out? So we can go ahead and pod install once you have that pod file. And you guys should go ahead and see these two lines in green. It should say installing Firebase 2.3.3. And it should say installing Firebase UI 0.1.2. And then it should also go ahead and give you this nice exclamation y thing that says close your project if you have one open. So I have a project open somewhere right here. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. And then we're going to go ahead and open your XC workspace. So how many of you guys have installed successfully, or how many of you rather need more time installing? Show you installing? Ah, just the pod file. OK. Pod file right here. Yep, no problem. So these three lines on 3, 5, and 7. OK, guys, make sure that you're not losing focus. Let's go ahead. And for those of you who have successfully pod installed, I pointed out this little nice exclamation point. Whenever there are exclamation points in code, you should probably heed those. So it goes ahead and asks you to close your current Xcode. So you can just quit Xcode. And then you can open the name of your workspace. So your workspace will go ahead and allow those pods to come in and live in that file. You guys, if you use CocoaPods before, this step shouldn't be crazy unfamiliar. You're just going ahead and closing that project and reopening the workspace. And you guys should get something that looks like this. So you should have the name of your application and your pods. How many of you guys can see that? Hands up. Hold them proud. Excellent. You guys should all go ahead and see something like that. And you should see the app delegate, the view controller, and the storyboard. OK, guys, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next part of it. So we got to do a little bit of setup before we do anything. We're going to go ahead and create our layout. So we're going to go ahead and drop, I want to say that's a navigation controller. That looks like a navigation controller. We'll go ahead and drop that on. And then we'll go ahead and wire up. Yeah, come on, drop. We're going to wire up a segue to our normal view controller. And we'll give it the root view controller. And we can delete that other one. So you have a navigation controller. You drag that on. And you'll go ahead and see those. It'll, it'll come automatically with a table view controller. But we're going to go ahead and build a little chat app. So it's just going to be a view controller that has a table view in it and a text field that we're going to go ahead and enter our text into. So you guys should all have something that looks like this, where you go ahead and have your little storyboard entry point on the navigation controller. And you have a normal view controller uh, with the relationship of root view controller. You guys have all used storyboards, correct? Yes? Am I speaking Greek to anyone? The idea of a root view controller? Excellent. It basically just means that the navigation controller has swallowed up that other view controller and kind of lives right outside of it. And then we can go ahead and if you really want, if you want that little bit of extra credit, you can go over. And one of these little things has yeah, the navigation bar. You can go ahead and set the properties of the navigation bar. I'm trying to, yeah, it's somewhere in there. We'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. But 
Okay. Does everyone have something that looks like this? Navigation controller? Normal view controller? Yes? Perfect. So now we're going to go ahead and add the two things into our view controller that we care about. We're going to go ahead and add the table view. So table view, where are you? Table view. Go ahead and drop that. Whoopsies. Come on. There we go. This is, there we go. Okay. Come on, table view. Drop. What's up? Yeah. Let's try this again. There we go. Perfect. So get a table view on there. I'm having a little trouble because of the resolution on this projector and my screen. But you're going to go ahead and essentially drag that to fill the content, at least the horizontal content. So it should look kind of like that. So you guys can see this little gray swab at the bottom. So we have a table view up top. And then we're going to go ahead and get a text field. And I need to zoom in again a little more. And we'll drop the text field in, stick that in the bottom, and drag it across the screen. Once we have that, we can drag our table view down to meet it. And you should have something that looks kind of like this. So I'll go ahead and actually in that beautiful table, I'll go ahead and just stick so you guys can all see it. Placeholder text, type, message, here. So you guys should have something that looks kind of like this. So you have a table view up top and a text field down at the bottom. And the last thing that we have to do is we have to grab one of these table view cells and drop it onto the table view so we have some content. So you guys should have something that looks like this. that has a prototype cell, your table view, and your text field. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds to a minute. Not trying to rush you. So if you need more time, I'll check again right at the end of that. So to put this nice text at the bottom in the text message here, on your text holder, or your, your text field, if you click your text field, and then you go up to the little uh, caret attributes inspector thingamajig, there is this thing right at the top, placeholder text. So you can also set it programmatically, and its Xcode is very nice in that it goes ahead, and if I hover correctly and the stars are aligned appropriately, uh, it will tell me the method call needed to do that. Uh, but I clearly have angered the Xcode gods, and it's not doing it for me anymore. There we go. Ah, I got it. I almost got it. Ah. So you can go ahead and down here in the bottom you can clear the constraints and then drag it and move it around. So what you actually what you have to do is you have to not put it in the table view. So you'll notice you'll notice I have my enclosing view and then the table view and the text field are at the same level. They're, they're sibling nodes in that tree. So if I had gone ahead and dragged that, uh, that into the table view, then it's showing the nest, which is, I think, what you guys are seeing. So make sure uh, you can kind of pull it outside or just on the side uh, kind of pull it higher. So like if I go ahead and have it, uh, I can't do that. Does that make sense, though? So if I were to add it um, further in, it wouldn't show up. Uh, they wouldn't show up as siblings, and they would be stuck inside the table view. Are you guys ready to move on quickly? We have one more task to do in this storyboard, and then we can, well, two more tasks to do before we can get rid of it forever. Are you guys ready? So the first thing that we have to do is we have to set a reuse identifier on our cell. So there are a bunch of different ways to go ahead and set up table view cells. We're going to do the easiest one, uh, at least for now, because I'm. We got it. We got to move through this. So I will just go ahead, and you click on your table view cell. You go up to the little attributes inspector, and it has this identifier. And I picked cell identifier 
So those are two lowercase l's and one uppercase i, uh, which is incredibly confusing. I'm sorry, fonts are terrible. Um, but you're going to go ahead and create something custom. It doesn't have to be cell identifier, but it does have to be the same throughout your project. Because uh, otherwise, you're going to have weird things happening. Your cells aren't going to show up. Everyone's going to be confused. And so at this point, we're done with the layout part. Um, we only have to do a couple other things. So if you guys go to your table view, you'll notice that you have this idea of a data source and a delegate. How many of you guys have played around with UI table view data source and UI table view delegate? Yes. How many of you guys have been infuriated when you set them all up programmatically and nothing shows up on your simulator? Yeah, a lot of you. That's probably because you didn't set those outlets. So we have to go ahead and drag them to the enclosing view controller. So it owns that now. And the other thing that we're going to have to do is we've set up the data source and the delegate. Now we've got to go and write a tiny little bit of code to go ahead and glue those things together. So we have to go ahead and set up outlets for our table view and our message input view. And so we're going to do that. IB outlet weak, I think it's var weak, and then that's going to be our table view, which is a UI table view. And then we also want to go ahead and have a message input field, which is a UI text view. So, and once you guys go ahead and see those outlets, you put in the outlet code there, you'll see these nice little bubbles pop up. Those are super cool bubbles. Because what they now say is that you can go ahead and connect them to something in your storyboard or in a nib or zib. So you guys, all you have to do is add these two lines of code to go ahead and declare those IB outlets one as a table view, and one as a text view. And I need to blow this up a little bit. Yes, question? Ah, yes, you're absolutely correct. UI text field. See, this is the fun part of live coding. Yeah. Because then I would have compiled it and it would have broken. So thank you very much. And if you guys see things like that, feel free. I have no shame. Uh, call me out on my horrible misspellings. Uh, let me go ahead and quickly. Make this bigger, fonts and colors, presentation. Is that big enough for you guys? Or do you guys want, do you guys want giant old person font? I'm, I'm old, so I need the big font. I'll go ahead. Oh my god, that's big. Wow, I did not expect that to be that big. Uh, we're going to make this a little smaller. That's giant. We're going to go presentation mode. OK, can everyone see that? At least my text doesn't always wrap to two lines. OK, how many of you guys need more time to add these two things? No one. Excellent. OK. This is where doing this on a projector is a terrible, horrible idea. So you guys know what this little Venn diagram looking item is? That's the split screen mode. So we're going into split screen mode because on one side, we need to open the storyboard, which doesn't fit. And on the other side, we need these two outlets, right? So we're going to go ahead and actually that this thing is the most useful part of it. All you really need is this sidebar and these outlets. So we have a table view outlet that I'm going to drag to the table view. And we have another outlet that I'm going to drag to the message view. So now we have table view and we have message input field. And oh god, if we scroll all the way over here, um, it'll go ahead and have the referencing outlet in view controller. And that's how we know they're hooked up. Table view is going to have the same thing. It has a referencing outlet in view controller. And that just means that we can go ahead and, by the name of it, reference it from our view controller. So now, because I can't see anything, uh, we're going to go get rid of the sidebar, get rid of the, or the, the two layout view, and go back to code. Any questions on that? So quick, quick moment of truth, command R. Hopefully your build should have succeeded. 
And you should see something that looks like this. You should see a bunch of table view cells and a, inside a navigation controller. And if I make it smaller, you'll go ahead and even have a little text field right at the bottom. If you see that, everyone go, yay! I was not enthusiastic, guys. Or, yeah. Are you guys seeing that? Raise your hands. You guys are better at raising your hands than doing tiny yays. I'm keeping it real, guys. A couple of you guys? Okay, where are people stuck? We're going to go with that. Are you guys, have you guys ma all made it past uh, opening it up and seeing the storyboard? Have you guys all made it past that? Is anyone still stuck on that? We're going way back. Okay, is anyone stuck on adding the navigation controller or any of that? You don't actually need the navigation controller. It just makes it a little nicer. Anyone stuck on that? Okay, is anyone stuck on getting the text field and the table view put together? Having the table view on top, text view on bottom. Anyone? Okay. You're getting air, oh God, I see giant stack traces. You can ignore everything above the stack trace part because that's, that's Swift's compiler being really weird as Swift's compiler is. Yeah. If you guys are getting weird errors, make sure that your outlets are hooked up properly. That's probably, and make, make sure that you've named things correctly. Naming is like, there are two, there, this is a, a direct quote from someone much smarter than I. There are two hard problems in computer science, naming and cache invalidation and off by one errors. That's the part where you guys all laugh because I told a joke. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all day. Actually, I'm only here for another half hour, so you're rid of me soon. Yep. So how many of you guys can see that beautiful, beautiful simulator that looks a little funky because we need better layout constraints uh, because auto layout does that to us? How many of you guys can see this? Text view, table view. Raise your hands, hold them high. We got a couple. Excellent. Help your friends out. They're nice people, I promise. Okay, guys, we'll do another minute on this, and then we'll move on. I hope to not have too high an attrition rate. That's what your friends are here for. Okay, everyone. Regain your focus. We're going to go ahead and add the Firebase part in. Or actually, do you guys want a break? Do you want to jump up and down for like a minute? You guys need to get up and, and stretch for a second? No? Okay, you guys are going to go heads down and code. We're going to do that. Yeah, I see some head shaking. You guys are ready. OK, so this is the fun part. This is where we actually go ahead, because uh, right now, we have a really boring application, right? So I can like put words in my text view, but I press return and nothing happens. Um, but I have a cool text view, right? Or a text field and a, and a cool table view. We're going to go ahead, and in several lines of code, we're going to go ahead and set up our table view to go ahead and process input. Um, and then we're going to go ahead or set up our text field to process input, set up our table view to go ahead and view things because that's what table views are good for. So watch carefully, everyone. We're going to go ahead and import Firebase and import Firebase UI. And if you've done everything beautifully correctly using frameworks and with a CocoaPod, these two lines will import cleanly, and you will have no angry little stop sign up in the corner. So import Firebase and import Firebase UI. So again, Firebase is that broad client library that allows you to kind of store and synchronize data between your device and the cloud. And Firebase UI is a really handy library uh, that I made to kind of reduce my code golf score to go ahead and make these demos super, super easy. So you guys should go ahead and be able to import both of them. And then right under where we declared those properties on this class, 
you're going to go ahead and say let ref equal Firebase. And there's this idea of a URL. So if you guys were now going ahead and instantiating an instance of Firebase that we're calling ref. And there's my Objective C showing. We're going to go ahead and give it a string for that URL. And we're just going to go ahead and call it make .firebase io. oh god, demo.com. So there we go. Oh, really? Come on. I'll add that. I'll add another space. So, sorry. Oh, correction. I need to make that a hyphen. So Firebase IO hyphen demo dot com. Really? Come on. So it should look like this. So you have let ref equal Firebase and then give it that URL. Uh, and actually what you guys should do, if you can all please for me, make school hyphen your name. So this is super dangerous that I'm putting Mike in because Mike was the most common male name for like 10 years running. Um, or just pick whatever nice little string you want right after it. So I'll put Mike so no one else steal Mike. Um, we're going to go ahead and do this so that uh, when I inevitably screw up and write something, it won't break all of yours. And same for you guys. When you write something that breaks mine, it'll only break you locally. The nice thing that you can do with these URLs, so I'm going ahead and copying mine, is you can actually go to your favorite web browser, which has to be Chrome, of course, and you enter that. And so I'm going to HTTPS makeschoolmike.firebaseiodemo.com and boom, you get this website. How cool is that, guys? You're, just, you're viewing my database right now. And you guys can actually all go to this if you want. If you want to go and check out mine, you can play along with me. And what this is, is this is a nice little graphical view into your Firebase. So I can type things, for instance. I can delete them. And now I can go ahead and say, add other things. So like I could add messages. And then add several messages. And you guys should go ahead and, and just as you guys see it appearing up here on the screen, if you guys go to this exact same URL, you'll be seeing that exact same data. So what I'm doing is I'm going ahead and doing that set. Yeah, and see, there you guys. You're getting the handle. No, no swear words. Nothing bad. I'm going to enforce that. I'll delete it. So please be nice. Question? Yes? What's up? You're trying to add? So you click the little green thing? Yeah? Ooh. So you have to add a value. So if your value is null, that's the same as a delete. Is it working now? So people should be able to go ahead and add things, overwrite things. And obviously, the programmatic way is infinitely better than this nice clunky UI. But it's a great little tool, right? Because you can go ahead and kind of introspect, so view into your database and see what's going on, which will be super, super useful when we go ahead and actually start debugging things. Any quick questions on that? Again, you can go ahead and open your version of it. I'll go ahead and delete it all because, oh, yes. Make school is awesome. Whoever wrote that, kudos. Good job. OK, now everyone stop writing there. OK, moratorium on rights. We're going to go back to the app. So that's what that reference is. Um, and that's just, again, the view of your database. And currently what we have is we have, there's no path. So what this is made up of, uh, as most URLs are, is it has this prefix, which is the name of that database. It has the server that it lives on, and then it has some path. So I could write to say slash messages. So this is the idea of you have a temperature place, you have a time place, you have whatever. Um, in my case, I'm just going to write directly to that top level because I know that I'm only going to have messages in here. Okay. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a data source. 
And so, creatively named Firebase Table View Data Source, because I'm incredibly creative when it comes to my naming, we're going to go ahead and, oh my god, there's an explosion of method signatures for this class. So we'll quickly go back a second. You're going to go ahead and create a variable that is a data source, and it is of type Firebase Table View Data Source. My god, T-A-B-L-E View Data Source. The longest name in the world. We're going to go ahead and instantiate one of that, and that takes a reference and a reuse identifier. So you guys remember that. So we have a reference because we have a reference up top. That's this little guy right here. We have the ref. A reuse identifier. So what did you guys name your reuse identifiers? Hopefully you picked something good. So hopefully you picked something that you remember. So mine was cell identifier. So you guys can see that now, cell identifier. And then we want self.tableView. Here we want self.ref as well. So as you guys can see, oh, now you're complaining. Why are you complaining? View controller does not have member named ref. Yes, it does. We'll go ahead. And, there we go. Hmm. Yeah, that's weird. There we go. We're actually just going to go ahead, and we don't need to do that. We're just going to go ahead, and it's, a, it's just a property, so we don't actually have to fill it out yet. But everyone should have these two lines, so they should have a reference. So we can go ahead and do this ref outside, because uh, we're letting it, so it's being a closure, it's a constant. And then we're creating this variable for the data source that is a Firebase table view data source. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and in view did load. So whenever we go ahead and load that view, we're going to go ahead and create the table view data source. So we can say data source equals Firebase table view data source and then give it that reference. So give it the reference, give it the reuse, reuse identifier, and give it the table view. So as you guys know, you have a delegate and you have a data source. So what we're doing is we're going ahead and creating the data source. The delegate is still up to you guys. So all we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to say that we do UI table view, table view, delegate, and then we'll just go ahead and say self.tableview.delegate equals self. So that takes care of one, right? And now self.tableview.data source is data source. So what we've done is we've just kind of wired everything up correctly now. And so what this is doing is this is acting like any other data source that you guys have seen. So we could do a little pop quiz now. Does anyone know the methods that UI table view data source requires that you implement? Pop quiz, guys. Yes. Yes, number of rows in section. And what's the other one that it makes you implement? self row at index path. Perfect. So notice how we've written neither of those. Ooh, magic, right? So we can go ahead and we can know what the number of rows in the section is, right? Because we as Firebase, as, as part of our data source contract, we know how many items we're pulling across, so we can do that. We can also go ahead and automatically populate the cells, uh, or rather automatically create the cells. So we can do both of those methods for you. The part that we can't do is we don't know how you want them laid out. So what you need to do is this method called populate cell. And so what that does, so correction, it's populate cell with block. 
and that has this block that has a callback that takes to any objects and returns a void. Mystery, right? We'll go ahead and fill that in. And we'll call this first any object cell, and we'll call the second snapshot. So you guys know that what cell for row at index path is supposed to do is it's supposed to dequeue a cell for you, and then in there you would go ahead and populate the cell as you want, say from an array that you have that, that stores that data, um, that you're, you know, you're backing data. So if we are going ahead and, and maintaining all of that for you, all you need to do is go ahead and take the cell that we provide and shove the appropriate data into it. So I'll go ahead and quickly, as I wrote it two seconds ago, we'll go ahead and steal it over here. So there is a little bit of copy paste. But what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and create two constants. So we're going to go ahead and take TVC, which is our table view cell. So that is a UI table view cell. And we're going to go ahead and cast the cell object to a UI table view cell. We need to go ahead and do that, because otherwise Xcode will complain angrily that our types are mismatched and nothing works. And then we also have this snapshot. And so this is what I was mentioning was when I asked for the time or the temperature, you return that to me. So it is an immutable view of the data when it changed. So just like someone said, hey, it's 1219 or 219 or, or whatever, um, I can't go and say, hey, like change the time to 210. No, because it was given to me, it's immutable, I can't do anything about it. So, uh, we'll call that snap, my bad. I name these things differently, so that should work now. Perfect. And then we, of course, get initialization, blah, 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 never used. The last thing that we have to do, we have this cell and we have this snapshot. We can go ahead and say, you guys remember how to do this? Dot text label, dot text. And that's going to be snapshot.value. And then we'll just go ahead and say text. So the snapshot value is, yeah, it always complains about that. Um, it always complains. Um, this is what we're going to go ahead and get back from our database. So the snapshot has a dictionary inside of it with a bunch of key value pairs. And so when we go back to our Firebase, I'm going to go ahead and have things that look like, let me quickly add message. So it's going to have a name. That can be Mike. And then it will have text. That will be, hello, make school. So our objects will look something like this. They'll have some unique identifier. They'll have a name. And they'll have a chunk of text. So when I get a, a value added under this reference, so say message one, we're going to go ahead and populate the name of the, the, the text that I write out onto the screen. So I'll quickly, there we go. Ah, that's what I needed to do. Casting is always funky. So there we go. So what it should look like is the text label dot text, the value, and then cast it to a string. We have to make sure that we're giving it the appropriate type. So in that little populate cell with block, we should go ahead and have that. So I'll quickly run this just to sanity check myself. If you guys would like to as well, feel free to. And boom, look at that. Right in our little text field, we have the text that I wrote. I can go over here. And on one half of the screen, I have the simulator. I'm going to go ahead and super cramp down the other side. So there we go. Look at that. All the CSS is getting really weird because it doesn't know what to do with it. Message 2. I'll add a name. I'll also pick Mike. I'll add, oh god, it's stuck on another element. Oh, whoopsies, overwrote it. Uh, text. And see, the cool part about that is, you guys notice when I overwrote it, the simulator over here actually deleted the element as well. 
And so I'll rewrite hello make school, and then I'll actually come in here and change it. And I'm really excited. Hello exclamation point. And you'll notice that I'm changing it in real time on the internet, and it's changing in real time in the simulator. And you wrote, oh god, one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code to make that happen. How cool is that? Yeah? This is where everyone goes, ooh, ah. Yeah. Was that not really cool, guys? You got to admit, that was pretty cool. No, yeah, that is a tough crowd. I also do party tricks, magic. I really don't. This is my magic. I should lead with that. You're right. I'll, I'll bring fire to the, to the next one that I do. Fire, ooh, yeah. Exactly. So that was super cool, guys. How many of you guys have gotten to that point where you're seeing that on your own? Anyone? A couple people? Is that not really gratifying? How much time did you spend fighting bugs? Like nothing, right? I fought all the bugs for you because I can't type. Was that not really cool, guys? Come on. More, more excitement. Thank you. The one person in the back with the slow clap. OK. So now we're going to go ahead and actually make that dynamic. So does anyone here know how to get data out of a text field? What should I be using? Yeah, anyone? Is there a delegate protocol that I might be using for this? Maybe? I don't know. OK. Spoiler, UI text field delegate. Also, computer scientists are really, really creative with their naming. Not. So we're going to go ahead and implement one of the uh, methods on UI text field delegate. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom. And it is text field should return. So text field should return, if you look up the super boring Apple Docs, it just tells you that when someone presses return, then it'll go ahead and fire. So we're going to go ahead and say text field should return. And what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and get the data from the text field, send it up to Firebase, and clear the text field. And the nice thing about this, exactly what I mentioned uh, on that slide, the, the nice animated GIF where you know, one, one person would push data up and all of it would be propagated out to the other clients. You yourself are actually a client. So when I go ahead and change something in Firebase, I change it locally, propagate that change up and out to all the other clients, which is why offline works the way that it does. So when I go ahead and disconnect, I will go ahead and be raising those events locally. My app will look and feel as if I'm still online, and then we'll synchronize if we need to. But enough on that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do the text field. So let text is text field dot text as a string. And then the other thing that we want to do, text field dot text, is the empty string. So we're going to go ahead and clear that. And it's going to complain that, yes, I do. I want to. Yes, and then I have to return a true. You're exactly right. And then the last thing that we need to do, uh, what do you, mer, everyone loves optionals. I just feel so excited when I write Swift because I have to stick a bunch of, uh, actually, we'll make this even easier, right? Because we don't actually need to get that text. We will just go ahead and say ref. So that is that Firebase reference that I was talking about earlier. We'll go ahead and just, we have ref. And then we're going to say ref child bot by auto ID set value. So what this is going to do is this is going to create a unique ID. So over here I have message one, which is not at all unique. Right, because you guys could all have messages named message one on yours. So what that unique ID is going to look like is just some random string uh, that goes ahead and creates a unique ordering. And we're going to go ahead and write, this is a dictionary in Swift. It is the name of the person, in this case Mike. I'm being very, very uncreative and not pulling this from anywhere. I'm just hard coding it. And then we're going to have the text, which is the text field's text. And then we're going to clear it and then return. So I'll go ahead and rerun this. 
and everyone will go, okay, we, we have that. We'll come down here to the text field. Hello. Yes, thank you. See, this is why live coding is fun. So what we have to do is we have to go ahead and say self.messageInputField.Delegate equals self. Thank you. So if we didn't know that, what we'd do, we have that. We say, oh, why isn't it working? You set a breakpoint. Come over here. And we'll type it in. Hey there. And look, the breakpoint never fires when you press return. Maybe you should go ahead and set the delegate. So we can go ahead, set the delegate, rerun it. It will take us back over to our simulator. Hello. Do that. Boom. Look at that. Our breakpoint fires. We're in the delegate. So I'll go ahead and do that. Rerun it. And look at that. Look at that. We go ahead and have this long, crazy string that I mentioned, which was that unique ID. And we have the name, and we have the text. So I can keep typing all day long and get more messages. How cool is that? So for those of you guys who have that working, everyone go ahead and point to make school mic dot Firebase IO demo. So you have that little string. That goes up in your Firebase URL, this let ref equals Firebase. Point there and start your magic. So just start typing into your app, and we should all see all of our messages starting to appear here. And yeah, there we go. Keep pushing them this way, guys. Yeah, hashtag YOLO. You're absolutely correct. So does anyone know how to solve the problem that I'm having right now where I'm having to scroll automatically? Anyone know what that method is? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I believe it's scroll view will scroll to the bottom, something on that. Yeah. Again, I'm not doing all the crazy things, but there are ways around all that. But as you guys can see, you guys can keep, keep adding those messages. We can keep deleting messages. We can do lots of crazy things. And you'll notice that all of those updates happen in real time. So the second anyone adds a new message, we see it updated. Yep. We see it updated. And then we see them all updated. Someone is adding bogus messages that don't have any content. Hey there. You guys should add some content. We could also go ahead, and if we really wanted to, we could go ahead and you know, in our return, go ahead and just return false if they went ahead and didn't put any content. So we could do, do all sorts of things. How many of you guys have gotten this far? Yeah? You guys enjoying it? We built like a full real-time chat app in like half an hour. Does that not blow your minds? It's got to blow a couple of you guys' minds. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here's the really fun part. So I'm going to go ahead and on my phone, wow, you guys heard a lot. Okay, you guys can all see, I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off, turn Wi-Fi off. I'm going to unplug, oh God, unplug. You guys can all see it's unplugged. There's no magic here. We're going to go ahead and keep typing if you guys have it open. I'm spelling things incorrectly. Hey to her, um, what's up? So you guys can see. How are you doing? You guys can see I'm offline. This is offline. Let's go network. I'll even, I'm like, yeah, it's all red. There is no network to be had anywhere on this computer. And you guys are still, a couple of you guys, you need to keep adding. Keep, keep adding messages. I need to see them. Unless you want to turn your Wi-Fi off too, because that's really fun too. So you can turn your network off and start adding messages. And then, actually, let's have everyone do that. I want to see a giant merge conflict. That's what I want to see. Okay, so everyone, everyone who's got it working, turn your Wi-Fi off. And in approximately 30 seconds, we're all going to turn our internet back on and watch all those messages come in. You guys excited? Also, whoever said Node.js is the only real dev language, 
Uh, we use Node for a lot of our services, so. I have become more familiar with Node than I ever want to be. Okay, guys, we're ready. Are you guys ready to put your internet back on? Oh, there we go. Okay, everyone, get ready. Get ready for the merge conflict to end all merge conflicts. Plug the internet back in. And what you guys will notice is when my internet comes back online. There we go. We should go ahead and see a bunch of things come back up. Until I say abort. Okay. <laughs> we'll just turn that back on. So that's why you always error check your code, guys. Yeah. So you guys should all be seeing just an absolute ton of messages. Yeah, there we go. And so that was that giant merge conflict that I mentioned. Um, and if I actually, so whoever wrote the little based god, uh, that's probably what broke it, because we don't, we don't actually do any validation, right? So we don't ever go ahead and say, hey, you know, your snapshot has to have text in it, uh, otherwise it'll all break. So if we were better programmers, and we are better programmers, uh, we would go ahead and actually check that it had it. Uh, but for demos, just roll with it. So any questions about that? Are you guys excited that you just wrote a kind of minimal chat app in essentially no code? You guys are just seeing this all, who, who keeps typing the, the blanks? You guys, come on guys, we're better than this. Yeah. Anyone have any questions on that? We went ahead and demoed a little bit of Swift. We went ahead and demoed a little bit of Firebase. We went ahead and wrote a chat app in, uh, in under 50 lines of code. So if I go ahead and delete this white space uh, to kind of you know, cheat and delete the, delete the comment and uh, kind of tighten things up, I think we did that in under 50 lines of code, guys. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah. Here we go, 40, 48 lines including white space and a couple comments right at the top. Yeah, that's eight lines of comments. Yeah, you guys have any other questions, comments? We can do lots of other things, so if you guys wanna stick around after the show, uh, I actually probably have to go, but I can show you how to do prototype cells. Have you guys used prototype cells before? Have you guys used custom UI table view cell subclasses before? Mind blown, yeah? That's cool, it's kind of a pain, yeah. Uh, and then the other really cool magic trick that we can do is we can actually go ahead and instead of doing these fdata snapshots, you can actually go ahead and create a custom subclass of NS objects. So it could be a message class or it could be you know, a sport class or whatever, whatever class you're gonna be expecting to get back from Firebase and automatically take the snapshot and shove it into a message class. So it'll avoid a bit of this, um, you know, the, the hangups that we had around SIG aborts on not having the appropriate things. So I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. Um, it's on the GitHub page. If you guys are on the GitHub, we can go to github.com slash Firebase slash Firebase UI iOS. You can see my smiling little face up in the corner here. And it gives you documentation. How many of you guys enjoy reading documentation? Okay, a solid group right in the middle. Um, Firebase's documents, so if you go to firebase.com slash docs, are really, really good. So if you go to, say, our iOS docs, we have a little quick start, and look at that. It tells you you can sign up for a free account. We have a free forever plan. You guys should all sign up for that, and you should all keep playing around with it. It's a ton of fun. We walk you through how to do CocoaPods and set up your pod file, set up Firebase in it. And we even give you the open your, your Xcode workspace. And then we also give you a little bit on, hey, how to go ahead and import Firebase in Objective-C and Swift, how to go ahead and read and write data from Firebase. We even give you a little chunk on authentication. So all that stuff that I mentioned right at the beginning on logging in with Facebook or Twitter. Uh, look how easy it is to go ahead and do email and password authentication. You go ahead and stick a user in, go ahead and stick a password in, and those can both come from the user, and they log in. It's really that easy. Um, so if there are no other questions, I'll be around for a little bit longer. 
Thank you guys all for being super attentive. I really enjoyed talking to you guys. Hopefully you really enjoyed listening to me talk. Uh, I enjoy talking a lot. Uh, I'll be around for a little bit longer. My name is Mike McDonald. If you guys are on the Twitters, you can hit me up at ASCII Mike, A-S-C-I-I-M-I-K-E. Huge nerd at heart, uh, like those 128 character alphabets. Uh, so go ahead, find me there. Uh, you can also tweet at Firebase. And if you have any questions, support at firebase.com. We'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of your day.